support number and they can call them. You know, you're out of it, right? Because you can't do a thing. Good that. morning. The Georgia Archives and Georgia Genealogical Society welcome you to the annual genealogy picnic. We have an interesting program planned for you today. I want to remind you that the 11 o'clock session will feature a panel of genealogy experts to answer your questions that you might have about family history research. If you have a question you'd like to ask, there are several ways to ask. Uh, for our in-person attendees, we have a box with, a, with slips of paper and a pencil at the back of the room, and you can write your question and put the question in the box. Or you can ask the question, your question during the actual session. And for our virtual attendees, you can ask your question in chat and we'll be monitoring chat and then we'll relay your questions to the group. Uh, a few housekeeping details. Uh, the restrooms are to your left as you exit the room from the back. There's also coffee and water on the mezzanine. Uh, now we have a brown bag lunch planned for on-site attendees from 12 to 1. And you can either eat outside in the amphitheater at the back here between the National Archives and the Georgia Archives, or here in the building in the patron lounge or the downstairs classroom. There will be water, soft drinks, and a selection of chips available uh, on a table in the lobby to go with your brown bag lunch. Uh, however, we will be locking the reference library from 12 to 1 so that the staff can eat lunch as well. And we apologize for this inconvenience, but we just do not have the staff to assist in the reference library and to help with the program. So we hope you understand. And we hope you will come back after lunch to do research. If you do stay and you want to do research, just remember that you need to stop by the welcome desk uh, and be signed in. OK, now our first speaker for today is Larry Thomas, who will be speaking on probing probate records for more than just a will. Larry, a retired U.S. Army captain with 23 years in aviation, transportation log logistics, a bachelor degree in aviation man maintenance management, an FAA airplane mechanic license, and an MBA in inf management information systems, and a project management professional certification. He began his genealogy research 30 years ago with his Thomas family, uh, Georgia resident since the 1750s, and then expanding into his his and his late wife's families. He began researching for clients in 2008 and presently regularly in 2015 operating www.atlantagenealogy.com. A graduate of ProGen 38 and a member of numerous genealogical and historical societies, uh, he serves on several genealogical society and nonprofit boards. Larry, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, well, good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you for the uh, invite. I uh, appreciate it. I uh, always like to get out and see face to face when I can, as well as uh, hybrid now that we have the technology. So, so many people, when they think about probate, they only think about a will. We want to talk about far more than just a will. I can get my computer to cooperate here. There we go. These presentations typically by professional genealogists are copyright. We ask that you not be taking pictures or recordings without express written permission. Or as Judy Russell puts it, getting permission from more people than you can count. I have a couple of disclaimers I put up. <laughs> One is history is what history was. Genealogists like historians don't rewrite it. We don't whitewash it. Uh, we don't skip over it. We treat it with respect and in the proper context. That means sometimes we come across words that are no longer politically correct, but they're there. And we still are going to use the information that we can as we gather records and information about our ancestors. The other one is I'm not a lawyer. I don't pretend to be. I didn't sleep at the Holiday Inn Express last night or any of that. I just am giving you genealogical information about courts that I've learned over the uh, time. If you have specific questions, go find a real lawyer. All right, let's get started. A lot of people don't realize that the, the legal term for probate really means to record, to record a legal document. It kind of morphed into proving a will. We're going to talk about what that means to prove a will in a little bit. And nowadays it means all aspects of an estate, but you have to understand in other places it has different terms. In Louisiana, it's a secession. In uh, the Carolinas, it was Chancellor's Court. So different states call it different things. When you walk into a court, don't ask for the probate office. 
say, I won't look at estate records. They will point you the right direction. So always when you go into a courthouse to do research, tell them what kind of records you want to look at and go from there. Some terminology, testate and intestate. In, uh, testate means there's a will, the will was proven and accepted by the court. Intestate means everything else. There was no will. The will was thrown out for whatever reason by the court. It was uh, challenged. So, so, so many reasons why a uh, thing may be intestate or just there was no will. And the other big thing that uh, people don't realize is there may not even be an estate. <clears throat> if they didn't own anything worth anything, then there's no estate. There's no need to probate anything. They didn't own land. They didn't own uh, a business. They didn't own anything that needed to be taken care of. So no, no probate required. When you're looking at a will, though, there's uh, some basic uh, fundamental areas, what we call boilerplate language. This is where you look at the old one that says, in the name of God, amen, I, Larry W. Thomas, do blah, 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 and I want my body buried in a Christian manner. I want all my justifiable debts paid. That's boilerplate. I'm not saying ignore it, but there's no meat there. The meat starts with, I bequeath, or my desire is, or this is what I want done with my stuff, <laughs> you know? That's where the uh, everything kicks in. After that, it's signed in front of witnesses. Now, a witness cannot be an heir. Key point. They can be a family member, but they cannot be an heir. And then you want to see who brought that will back into court to prove it. What that means is the person has now died. I'm bringing the will to the court. We got to open a probate uh, uh, process who brought it in and when. So what are some of the problems we run into with wills? Many men, and most of the wills in the historic days were written by the men, because the women didn't inherit it much, the wives didn't. They only listed the kids that were minor or the children by their last wife. Now that doesn't mean they didn't care about the other children, but they were probably already taken care of. When I do a, a presentation on land records, I tell people to look for land being given, quote, for love and affection, unquote, to my son, my daughter, my nephew, my grandson, whatever. So they've already been taken care of. These are the children by the, the last wife they had or the children who are minors. What does that mean? That means you're missing a lot of kids. And we're gonna talk specifically about Ambrose Watson and Richard Ricks. Another thing that you have to understand is sometimes estates took years to close, which means sometimes heirs died before the uh, estate was finalized, and that's going to shift things around. Well, you see the daughter listed simply as Mrs. John Smith. Well, boy, that helped me a lot, you know, or they're only listed by their first name. Uh, Mr. McCreary here has got one where the uh, ancestor just listed the uh, young daughter as Polly. Is Polly married? We think she is, but he didn't say. He didn't use any last name. You know, so you're stuck still trying to chase things. And sometimes the daughters got married while the estate was still open. And I've got examples of a lot of this stuff. So, as I said, testate means that what was written, filed, and accepted. In testate is everything else. Look for executors or administrators being challenged in the court. Somebody don't like somebody. I did one for somebody that, yes, the man had 15 children. Yes, he had two sons named George. He never had a son named Thurgood, but Thurgood is the one that's challenging his mother as the executor. <laughs> so is Thurgood one of the other Georges? Don't know yet. Okay. So when you see a, an, an executor or an administrator challenged, that's where the gossip is. It's a good place to look. <laughs> And uh, executrix, administratrix is a female version of executor. All right, whether it's testate or intestate, whether there's one or not, what do they all have in common? Every document that comes into the courthouse gets recorded in either a minute book or an index book. And it's going to talk about the disposition of the estate, what happened to it, who got what, what was done. 
Every year the account is open, there's an annual return. That's another record that tells you who's still living, where they're at, what's going on. And again, all documents get recorded. So you want to start with those books. You want to look for things like guardianship letters, if there's minor children, vouchers, bonds, who the administrators are. Inventory and appraisement, two dispassionate people have to go out there and inventory the property every spoon, every plow, every horse, every acre, and give it an appraisal so they can determine the estimated value of the property. This tells you how, you know, what the man, uh, person did, what kind of livelihood they had, and how wealthy they were or were not. <clears throat> 12 month support. If there's minor children and there's not enough money, the uh, the widow is going to ask for support from the county government. That's a 12 month support. Don't be baffled if you see the term infant. An infant is a minor. In the old terminology, that's exactly what infant meant. Males under 21 females under 18 even back then they they figured the women uh, matured faster than us men did quit nodding your head laura <laughs> 14 year olds even back then as it is today can choose their guardian with of course permission minor orphans historically if they were an orphan would be apprenticed out now apprenticing out is somewhere somewhere in between fostering and adopting because they don't become a legal member of the family but they become like a foster child but they must be taught a trade so they're apprenticed out to a blacksmith to learn blacksmithing they're apprenticed out to a farmer to learn farming and this was going on into uh as recently as 100 years ago my great grandfather took in two apprentices in the 19 teens and sometimes you'll see the courts stepping in to remove children from a widow who cannot support the kids. And especially in colonial times, I see it uh, happen more times than not, and you'll see it in the court minutes. So you want to research the court minutes back then too. And they, it's like reading church business meeting minutes it's to get boring going page by page, but you're scanning for names and looking to see what happened. So as I said, everything comes in and it gets recorded in an index book or a minute book. And then that will tell you the document and where to go find it, whether it's minute book C, page 40, bond book BB, page 57. It's going to tell you where to go look for it. Now these are going to be transcribed or abstracted notes of what happened. Where did they appear? If I go to a county? In the, in the uh, probate office. There is a general index for everything. Right? For, for that office, for time periods, yes. And I'll talk about more in a minute. If the book is, is still in existence. All right, we'll get back to that. Thanks. Right, we're going to get to it here. So every scrap of paper was supposed to be saved. This is called the loose files or loose papers. And a lot of times they're uh, in a trifold and in a drawer and some places have taken them out and put them into vanilla file folders to make it real easy to find it. But I go down to Meriwether County specifically to research two sons of the sheriff down there who went by Major Hall. My client's ancestor also went by Major Hall and they believe his name was William, that he was the William that was the son of the sheriff. Turns out he wasn't. But anyway, I go down there and the minute book says the, the papers are there. I go open the two middle folders and they're completely empty. On top of that, they had a minute book A-1 and A-2, and A-2 cannot be found. And somebody many years ago whited out the dash one of minute book A-1, so it looks like only minute book A. So I took the judge, probate judge back there and showed him because you have a 17 year gap now between book A and book B because A2 was missing. And he's sitting in his, uh, uh, the uh, outer office where his clerks were. He goes, I can't imagine anybody would try to take something out of the uh, courthouse. His clerk said, your honor, I stopped the woman from ripping a page out of the marriage book because when grandma died, grandpa did not marry that woman. 
<laughs> so yes, sometimes things just have disappeared over time. Unfortunately. As I said, every year that the account, uh, the estate is open, they have to file an annual return. Guardians have to file a return. And here's where you track the lives of the heirs. And this particular one is a return followed by my second great grandmother, Mary Thomas, for her children that are minors. There's one missing, and we'll talk about that in a moment. My great grandfather took 10 years and a month to close his estate. He died in October of 26, the estate closed in November of 36. So back to my second great grandfather, Banner Thomas and Mary Walker. My grandfather always said Thomas men were good looking, couldn't help it, but I don't know what happened to Banner. <laughs> but anyway, you, you know, um, my great grandfather, General Jackson Thomas is, 20, uh, is, is of age. And there's Mary, there's Joseph Henry, who became a judge later on after that, Julia, Nancy, and John Rapart. I point that out because two things happened at the time my second great-grandfather died. One, my, grand, my great-grandfather became guardian for a J.M. Thomas, and I could figure out who J.M. is. His oldest brother is the administrator. He wouldn't need a guardian. And my uh, second great-grandfather, or great-grandfather did have a son, J.M., but why is he only the guardian of one kid and not all of them? The fact behind that, we'll just brief uh, thing is, his uh, oldest son's mother died in childbirth, but prior to that, his father-in-law had deeded land to his daughter and her heirs, and he didn't much trust General Jackson Thomas, so he appointed G.J.'s father, Banner, as the guardian. So when Banner died, G.J. became the guardian, but he had to report to the court every year, and he could not sell that land because it wasn't his to sell. He had to get permission to rent it out. So there's legal maneuvering done in these estates. So that's what this is. Um, but here is the guardianship for Julia, who is a minor. And it's not done by her mama. It's done by her father-in-law. Julia is a 14-year-old married girl now in uh, Georgia. And she has her father-in-law become her guardian. She goes into court and this is quote, shows to the court that she is 14 years of age, that she is not satisfied with her present guardian and desires her removal and wishes the court to appoint as guardian of her person and property, Henry A. Bennett, who consented. She's a 14 year old married girl and she just fired mama. <laughs> don't ask me why, I don't know, before my time, all right? So minors could pick their guardian. Keep that in mind, as long as they were uh, eight, uh, 14 or older. But this also brings up a point, because I was at a national conference one time, and I heard a national speaker say, well, I was doing the research, but that can't be right, because she would be 14 and married and having kids. Honey, you haven't researched the rural South. <laughs> you know, not at all. I've seen 13. Nothing below 13 yet. So, you know, if they're coming up at seven, no, wrong person, you know. But, yeah, it was. All right, Richard Rex. In his will, his devisees, which means heirs, his son Hampton, son Rutherford, a daughter, Arcissa, never seen that one before, and son Caswell. Caswell is a minor because he has a guardian appointed for him. Well, what about the other children? Particularly Daniel, I'm convinced Daniel is a son, and I know Richard Jr. is a son, and I know Arthur is a son from other documents. Where are our, the children? Are we going to find them? I was telling uh, Penny, uh, I've got a presentation I do on how not to do genealogy, because I like to poke fun at people. And a lot of people, their tree is a straight line up, no brothers, no sisters. You have to look at the siblings. Caswell died as a minor, as a teenager with a lot of land. He had no will. In the court records, we find out that a brother-in-law of Caswell's was appointed the administrator. He did something improper, and all the siblings sued. And here they are listed. Melathan Thickpad, who's married to Barbara uh, Ricks, Daniel H. Ricks, John Ricks, Florida Ricks. I didn't know about Florida Ricks. Now I know about another daughter I didn't know about. 
James Arlene, because his wife, who was a daughter, had died, but there were minor children, so they get their share. Arthur Ricks, Richard Ricks Jr., Mary Hicks, so Mary married a Hicks, and Esther Ricks. You have to look at all the documents. You have to look at the estates of the siblings. Quite often, if somebody died childless, it was left to nephews and nieces, or brother-in-laws, sister-in-laws. Don't overlook the estates of the siblings or the people you suspect are the siblings. But what about Ambrose Watson? Ambrose signed a will in 1860 and he named Ambrose M as the executor. Louisa, Thomas, John, David, and Jesse, who turns out are the children of his second wife. Who was his wife? Did she inherit or get a dower? We'll talk about dower in a minute. Was she only his was she his only wife or second wife, third wife, fourth wife? Well, I don't know how many. And we, you know, when did Ambrose die? Listed all the children. And what happened to Ambrose M after what happened? Now this I'm pulling from a uh, scavenger hunt we did. Yeah. I'm sorry, we had a question on the chat from the previous page. What does uh, FIFA mean? Face value. The face value. Face value. At, fa at face value. So I had done a scavenger hunt with the Cobb County Genealogical Society group, and her name was Jane. It's hard to read, but if you look at the census and compare it to the census for 1860, you see her name was Jane. And she received a dower, which means a third of the, uh, she received a, um, a third, uh, and she also received the life estate. Uh, Ambrose specified what was to be done with her share upon her remarriage or death, and that's what it says here. I want everything sold by my executor and equally uh, divided among all my children. So look for this, and then look, if that's what happened, then look for when the, the widow dies, because you're going to see the land transactions again. It's going to answer questions you may have. And again, like I said, you want to research when she died and who's still alive at that time. Everybody thought Ambrose died August 28, 1861, the day he signed his will. Well, folks, I signed my will several years ago. I ain't dead yet. <laughs> okay, don't go by the date on the will. The truth is he died sometime between 28 August and 22 November. 22 November is when the uh, will was proven and the grave marker does say 13 November. So it, it, it lines up right. But always look closer to the date the will was proven. Remember that proven is when somebody brings in the will to the court and says, we need to open the probate. Please don't open my probate before I'm dead. All right. And the reason we can't trust the will alone is, like I said, it only named those children. And I knew he had a son named Robert. I knew that. And it turns out he had seven children by wife number one and six by wife number two. So how do we know this? Well, Ambrose M, the executor, dies in the Battle of Sharpsburg two years later without wife, without issue. And if you see the term without issue, that means they have no legal heirs. So now what? And he hadn't finished what he was doing. Well, the siblings, once again, they sued their dead brother's estate. Now that sounds mean, but it's not. It's just a legal maneuver. And they took what they had already received as their share they shoved it all back into the court system and let the courts appoint a commission to divide the assets of their father's estate. This is why we look beyond the will. We look for every piece of paper, every part of the estate until it's completely closed out and we look at the siblings. And there we find the names of all the children by the, the first wife and this kids by the second wife. And what I want to point out is we find out that Edith Watson married a J.C. Rhodes, Louisa Watson married a D.C. Crow, Sabra Watson married John Whitman, but she had been previously married to Elihu Phillips, had a daughter, Elihu died. We find out a lot of this stuff. Now, you know, um, my friend Diane uh, Barfield does a great presentation on finding the ladies. There's the ladies. <laughs> They're hiding sometimes in the estates. If you if you uh, take the time to look, we see who they married as their husbands. Because a lot of times back then, 
the the daughter, if she was married, couldn't sign to accept her share. Her husband had to sign for her. Remember my disclaimer, history is what history was. Larry didn't write it. Larry went around that. <laughs> So what are you going to do when you start dealing with estates? You want to transcribe all the important documents. You don't need to transcribe everything, but all the important documents. Transcribe in a verbatim, misspellings at all, lack of punctuations. I mean, I look at one that uh, from um, another one. Uh, when you first read it, you can't tell if she's calling her granddaughter a heifer or the cow, you know, refer to the cow heifer as scrappy, you know, because there's no punctuation. Transcribe it verbatim as it is. Then carefully abstract the important parts and write a synopsis. And then compare the synopsis to what you wrote. And why? Because in our brain, we get confused. Downstairs, no, I'm not sure where, no, it's probably one of the manuscripts upstairs. Um, are uh, part of my ancestor that moved us to Georgia's estate. The kids signed powers of attorney for a guy to go to deal with the property in Delaware here in Georgia. They, you know, but to go with the power of attorney and convince the courts in Delaware, he's got sworn affidavits. One of them said I was the MIDW and then you can't read anything else because the paper is so worn and weathered and torn. Probably said midwife. Another one said, uh, I saw the baby nursing. Okay, now in my mind, I'm writing this synopsis. Who said which? <laughs> you know? So you want to come back and compare what you're writing to what was actually written so that you've got your story straight. And people will come back later and say, well, you goofed. And then you want to follow that along with your original, you know, copies of your original papers and you want to share it with other people. And, you know, if you uncover a, a great truth, well, share it by all means. People would love to know. When you deal with the estates, you want to look at who bought what. A lot of times family members got first dibs or close friends got first dibs. Are they related? If you see a, a name on the, uh, their estate sale, that's the same surname as one of the witnesses or uh, people that you see witnessing land transactions or could be kid. You want to research that name. That's what we call the fan club. Family acquaintances and neighbors. Who are they? How are they related? As I tell people, you know, there was no eHarmony.com. There was no Match.com. People married the girl next door or three farms over type thing. So you want to research these people. Are there special considerations? <clears throat> I was reading one recently where one of his daughters was mentally challenged. Now we know mentally challenged because I said history is what history was. The subsequent census has the word idiotic, which means mentally challenged. He said in his will, I, if, if it boils down to nobody gets nothing to take care of this daughter, that's what I want. You take care of this daughter until the day she dies. So you see special considerations in there sometimes for people with special needs. You also see things that make me wonder, okay, all these people are getting all this stuff with all the money, but John and George get $1 each and that's all they're ever to get. <laughs> is it because they already got their inheritance or is daddy a little mad at them for something? <laughs> you know, we just don't know. You want to see what was sold, as I said, that indicates their wealth, their lifestyle. If you don't know what the occupation is and the guy's got a whole bunch of blacksmithing tools, guess what his occupation was? <laughs> you know, or a whole lot of farming equipment. So you want to see it, uh, what that was. And it kind of indicates, you know, their wealth too, is, uh, what kind of money they had. And back then, land was everything. So uh, the value was all in, uh, a lot of times in land. A little bit about dower. Dower laws have changed regularly over the years. So, I mean, I was talking to Judy Russell one time about one. It's like when a, a man uh, was married and would sell land, the wife had to get, permi get permission regardless. And then it didn't. And they did. And then it didn't. And she goes, go look at the laws, Larry. When, when did that law go into effect? And then they repeal it. Had she died and he hadn't remarried yet? These are the things you want to look at with dower. 
It was typically a third, but sometimes they were simply left a life estate. And that's where you want to look for the disposition of that estate. And sometimes the, uh, the wife could refuse her dower in exchange for a child portion. So again, you want to look at all the follow-up and what happened, why, what they did and why they chose it. You'll see who's still living and who's not. Now, the final return is a big one, if you can find it. I've run into cases where I can't find the final return, but this says who got what, and it lists it. Now, understand something when you see weird numbers coming up. So I explain it this way. My grandfather, uh, after my biological grandmother died when I was real little, he remarried. That's the grandmother I knew, grew up with, and loved. He changed his will so she got a child's portion. So he had four children that lived to adulthood and that she was fit. So this one fifth. So when my grandfather died, Eula May got one fifth. Thelma got one fifth. Grandma got one fifth. Millard had died with three children. So each of his kids got one third of one fifth. My father had died. We each got one quarter, because there's four of us, one quarter of one fifth of the share. So when you start seeing these smaller numbers and maybe the same name, could be because it's a grandkid and somebody's, uh, one of the children have died. These are indicators you want to look for. So when you see kind of strange uh, fractions like that. <clears throat> so with G.J. Jackson, this is uh, uh, his, and it shows who got what. And we see Mrs. J.F. Cauley, so I know a daughter married, married a Cauley. Uh, we see Martha Patterson, so Martha has been married and either divorced or widowed at that time. Laura married a Sarvis and J. A. And, um, one of the other daughters married a Varnador. <clears throat> I got to point out, I told you G.J. stands for General Jackson Thomas. That was his legal name. He was never in the military. His name was General Jackson. Laura decided to try to beat him. She married a guy whose first name was Admiral. <laughs> <laughs> I always get a kick out of that when I see it. And then um, GJ's brother, JR, is the guardian for the minor daughter, Murtis. So you see the, the final disposition of who gets what. What are some things to look for? I said the, the sale of the items. You will look for funeral expenses. If you see a receipt for funeral expenses and you still don't know where they died, you're getting real close. Because they probably ordered the casket the day of or day after. All right. You want to look for the receipts for the uh, money coming in and money going out. And like I said, the names of the men could be the husbands of the daughters. And look for the disputes. So one of the stories on my uh, late wife's side has to do with, you know, I tell people I taught my wife to cook because she didn't know how to cook. Because my mother-in-law didn't like to cook because her mother couldn't cook, because her mother didn't have to cook. But see, Catherine married below her father's station. He was a German immigrant, uh, became a uh, grocer, uh, and this was what my, my wife died 11 years ago, before she died. I calculate in that day value, uh, it was, his estate was $35 million. The dude had money. And Catherine married below the station, so within 24 hours, he wrote her out of the will. But when he died, she challenged it all the way to the New York State Supreme Court on the basis that the will was improperly executed and poorly written. The judges came back and said, you're right, it was improperly uh, uh, executed and poorly written, but his intent is crystal clear, you ain't getting nothing. <laughs> so she lived with her mama till the day her mama died. So she still had the servants. <laughs> You know, we, we learned these stories, and I had heard that story. I just didn't know it until I found it in Google Books, people. Always Google the names. Always Google the names. Every so often, you, you may have researched your name so there's nothing left. Wait a year or two and do it again. And you'll be surprised how much starts popping up now because it's being indexed or Google Books 
you know, Google and Amazon and them are trying to take over the world anyway. So, you know, <clears throat> which another story like that though, my, my mother-in-law brought home a, bo a boy from college. She wanted a date and uh, her mama said, what's your name? Yeah, mm -mm, y'all are cousins. <laughs> You know. So what else is in the probate office? Birth certificates, birth registers. We want to look for these. Marriage license, applications, marriage bonds. Years ago, a man had to post a bond that says it's a legal marriage. Bans, those were announcements made in the church and uh, local newspapers about the wedding again. If somebody wants to come back and say, wait a minute, he's already married, uh, you know. Death certificates, death registers, mortuary records, and sometimes the coroner reports. If the death is suspicious whatsoever, you may want to find those coroner reports. Again, Judy Russell's got a great presentation on that. But the mortuary and the death registers are where you can spot epidemics. I mean, just because you know the person died of typhoid doesn't mean there was an epidemic. But when you look at a, um, the mortuary schedule from the census or death registers and you see that 19 out of 25 people on that page died of typhoid and there's five pages of it, you know there was an epidemic. This is where you find that kind of information. It's all in that probate office or chancellor's office or uh, now Louisiana, I'm not sure which one because if that's the course of session, I have had no dealings with Louisiana other than a class I took through. IGHR. So what happens if you see a, a marriage license was issued, but not recorded, finalized? Does that mean they did get married? Not necessarily. You, now you have to go look at the census and other things of where they're living as husband and wife. It could be they didn't actually go through the marriage, or it could be they were too lazy or too cheap to file the paperwork. You know, so don't don't make any assumptions based on that. Um, but I learned something recently doing some research down in Macon for, um, I'm looking for the daughter of a corker who's on the 1910 census as a corker, 1920 census as a corker. Her mom dies. She's living with her, her grandmother and she's listed 1930 as a corker. Then she gets married, divorced, and then she gets married again in 1948 and I've lost her, you know. Uh, and Muriel Jackson, for those of you who know her down there, that make and love that woman. She goes, go get the marriage application. To the what? She goes, that was 1940s, Larry. Go get the marriage application. She won a corker. Before Mama married a corker in 1906, she married a Merrick. She's a product of the marriage to Merrick. Merrick died in 1908. 1909, she married the corker. So this kid is not a corker. Just miss that, uh, give it that name on the census records. So if marriage applications exist, go get it because that's who mom and daddy is. They didn't exist back then. <laughs> you anticipated my question. <laughs> 1924. Okay, 1924. In Georgia. And yeah. some counties yeah. didn't keep them. There are none that we can find in Clark County. Uh, and his is back in the early 1800s. <laughs> 1924. 1924, Kayla says, when they have marriage applications in Georgia if the county kept it, because Laura said some counties didn't keep them. Uh, unfortunately, you know, a lot of the historic records have been tossed out. You know, you want to check the archives, you want to check the li local libraries, historical societies, anything. Um, that, I mean, that reminds me, about a year ago now, my ancestor was from Burke County. Well, actually, Screven, but at the time he died, it was still Burke County. And I know nothing exists prior to 1826. It just doesn't exist. And I got an email from somebody that wanted a will from like 1793 or something. And I'm like, doesn't exist. And they said, yeah, there's a copy at the uh, Special Collections UGA library. So I emailed them because they were closed because of COVID. And she sent it to me. And I sent it to the lady, no charge. I mean, I didn't spend but three minutes typing an email. So, but by and large, you know, a lot of them do not exist anymore. Now, a lot of people think everything has been digitized and online or available here at the archives. Nothing will be further from the truth. Family Search would pick and choose what they were going to scan when they went in. I mean, some places I've heard they go in, anything that's not nailed to the floor, they're scanning. And other times, 
they decide what they want. So you still may need to take trips to a courthouse. So I have some friendly tips for visiting a courthouse. They should be in your handouts. Don't pull a Larry, call ahead. The reason I say don't pull a Larry is when I was going through ProJet, it was a Tuesday evening, it's like, crud, I need this stuff. I'm making a last minute trip tomorrow morning to uh, Dodge County. I pull up to Dodge County and this is what I see. 10 o'clock in the morning, no American flag. That tells me something's amiss here, you know? The sign of the door said closed indefinitely by the health department. Now they packed up some of their books and moved to the Chamber of Commerce. Be courteous with these people. I say dress, you know, wear something business tech casual, don't go in there and cut off and flip flops or jeans. And be very courteous to these people because it's not their job to help you find great grandma. Their job is there's the books. Okay? In places like Dodge County, when they were in the courthouse, it was, if you're watching camera, I've been lying, we'll book one, we'll book two, we'll book three, we'll book four. Down the road in Telfair, they go through the doors and good luck, because we'll book one is over there, we'll book two is over here. I mean, it's a mess. It's not their job to help you. But if you're polite and courteous to them, they'll bend over backwards for you. And I got talking to the lady there, uh, one of the clerks, and I said, you may not realize this, but occasionally when I'm giving presentations on courthouse research, I talk about your daughter. And her daughter's a little girl. She gives me that funny look like, okay, what's with you? Because you probably don't remember I was here about Thanksgiving two years ago, and she wanted to help. And I was telling her, you know, I appreciate the help, honey, but these books are big, and they're heavy, and they're real old. They were written 150 years ago, this one. Her eyes got big, her mouth dropped off, she goes, did you write them? <laughs> the mom was like, yeah, she still doesn't have a governor. I said, I'm 60. I don't have a governor either. <laughs> Trust me. But then I got talking to the probate judge and said, yeah, my girlfriend's going to laugh at me because I didn't call ahead, which is what I tell everybody always to do. And some of the books I need you don't have here. They're probably at the courthouse. He's like, well, do you know which books and which pages? I said, yeah, your honor. And he said, well, when you're ready to go, Follow me and we'll go there. I'll take your phone and go in there and take the pictures. Thank you. So we drive over to the old courthouse. It's closed. He's got the keys. He's the judge. And uh, gets out of the car and he goes, do you see any sheriffs? I went, I don't see any sheriffs around it. He goes, neither do I. Come on, let's go in. <laughs> and we go in and we get what I need. Be polite. Be courteous to them. You know, be friendly and all that. And sometimes they'll bend over backwards to help you. Okay. Now, I don't see this too much with probate as much as I do with land deeds and other things. So sometimes there's unique indexing and your handout should refer to a uh, book by uh, Miss Rose on all you want to know about indexing. As a friend of mine in, in the uh, extra reading at the end, uh, my friend Jane Campbell said that Campbell indexing system makes her want to change her last name. Okay. <laughs> um, did the ex, yeah, Christine Rose, Christina Rose. Anyway, uh, good information on uh, trying to understand the indexing. Just open up the book and look at it if it's kind of really uh, strange and bizarre. Now, I kind of went through this fast because I knew we were going to uh, start late. So at this point, what questions do you have? And I do have a, a weekly blog I send out on weekends typically. Uh, if you want to sign up, you can email me or hit me up at my website, atlantagenealogy.com. Questions? Oh, somebody asked if the handout was available for the online folks. We can um, send it out after the program. We can get the oh. attendance report and send it out if that's... Okay. Okay. I don't know how it works with Teams. <laughs> Richard. Well, you said index books. What year did those begin? Well... Some, some of them are back in the 1800s. Um, so it's just, if you pick up the book and it just does, doesn't make sense, then you have to you know look at how the index is, is being done. Someone says, uh, I'll pick on you, McCreary is on page 57. Yeah, Nesmith that's on 55. And then you get to 57 and you see a 57A, 57B, 57C, 57D, until they run out of McCreary's <laughs> or ver versions of McCreary. So it's just different indexing. It just I, I just want you to be aware of it. Should I check 
in the counties where it says minor minutes or something like that, whatever those books are. That well, it, it, like I said, most fast I see this in land of deeds. I have not run into it yet with probate. I just want to make people aware of it. Uh, if you go on Family Search and open a book, you have one of the uh, the books at the very front. It'll say if there's an indexing system and, and what kind. And try to explain it. Yes, ma'am. Um, I know you're not a lawyer, but wait a minute. Wait a minute, a liar or a lawyer? <laughs> 1790. If somebody owned property in South Carolina and two different counties in Georgia but didn't have a will, would there? Yes, and that, that reminds me of something I didn't mention okay. <laughs> is, okay, let's say Burke County because it burnt. Let's say the guy died and he owned and he had a will and he owned land in um, Appling County or South Carolina. A copy of that will would be have been copied and taken to that county for disposition. So if there was no will, would you have to be an administrator? There'd be an administrator and they would have to have gone into that court with a copy of it. So that was one of the other things I was looking at in Meriwether was uh, for another client who knew a copy of a will was in Meriwether because the person owned land there too, even though they didn't die there. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, I actually, for the past uh, six years, I was actually doing this research and uh, I was actually working on, uh, working on my family being on the National Register. So we had to, look, we had to go through all of these uh, records and all of this stuff you know, to actually prove a lot of family all history and, and all of that. But being an African American, you realize that, you know, those those probate records and stuff is going to cut off at a certain time, especially um, we talk like 1865 and back is nothing. And then they didn't keep records that good up until maybe the 1900s, you know, like the 1900s. But how we was able to prove our case, and you know, I advise any African American family, if you you know, if you if you want to, you know, um, take an alternative way of actually finding your family members and the reference and stuff on them, um, we actually found this Baptist church. That church actually um, they called their slaves servants, but they treated them just like regular members of the church. So therefore, when they got married, they let them get married. They recorded their marriages. They recorded when they um when they got so you had death records and stuff like that, you know. And they recorded when they had children and all of that stuff. Um, so I never heard of that before. Never seen anything like that. And I and I even realized that you know the church would keep extensive rappers like that because you know there's an old slave cemetery out here no markers but the extensive records of big kept we know everybody that's in that cemetery we may not know where they are located at out there because we don't know what they are at hmm. and, and i guess the other most important thing was in order for you to join the church you would have to be in good standing with your other church. You had to bring a record. Yes. So you were in good standing. Okay. They made the slave do the same thing. Mm -hmm. So therefore, we was able to track them back using those records because they said Henry came from uh, North Carolina and he was a member of this church <coughs> and he was in good standing with the church. Then yeah. you go to that church. If Henry was at another church, you could find that <laughs> record and say, "Oh, Henry was a member of this church, but he brought this letter to us, and he was in good stead." Yeah, and um, so what the gentleman was saying for people online is, uh, particularly African American research, you can find some things in a lot of the churches in the church records, uh, even during the period of slavery, and. Um, Southern Baptist Records or at Mercer University campus in uh, Macon. General Association of Regular Baptists is at Mercer campus here in Atlanta. Uh, and Emory has a lot of the is it Methodists, I think. I yeah. So, yeah, and because and, I've been at the one Mercer and Dunham um, 
uh, Macon going through old Baptist church records and, and see that stuff. Indica Indicator has Presbyterian. Columbia Indicator has University. Columbia University. Theological Columbia Theological Seminary in Decatur has Presbyterian yes. records. Yeah, so these are places to, to look. From Montreal a number of years yes. ago. Okay. I'll be right with you. Yes, ma'am. I said, yeah. Uh, yeah. When you listed uh, marriage records, you, you mentioned the uh, EAJN. Yes. Uh, and that's the Those were announcements that were put in the paper and the church uh, uh, well, program and stuff well, well, announcing yeah. this planned marriage. So if anybody knew that the guy was actually already married or a criminal or something, they could speak up. Yes, ma'am. Make it down in Macon at uh, Mercer University is a Southern Baptist Church Records. Mercer. Mercer. Mercer University. Special collections. Just call ahead. I called ahead, told me exactly which ones I wanted. I walked in and the microfilm were lined up for me. And they have more than the Southern Baptist stuff. They film any Baptist record from Georgia. They send them to Sanford University in Birmingham and film any Baptist record they can get from Georgia and they cover the cost of the film. And then Mercer has a copy of the microfilm. And then Mercer gets a copy of the microfilm as does the church if they want it. But they are trying to preserve all these Baptist records. And like I say, it's not just Southern Baptist Convention. They are trying to collect every Baptist record out of Georgia and preserve it. Yeah, so yeah, I was just saying, yeah, I was just saying the um, uh, GARB are at the, Mer the uh, at the Mercy here in Atlanta. And other, Southern Baptist and other Baptists. So just check with Mercer. Mr. Miller. Uh, we had a couple of questions for from online, um, where would someone look for a case or court order that led to the sale of property, such as the sheriff's sale? Um, and could an executor or purchase assets from an estate? Uh, the administrator could purchase, uh, and quite often did. Uh, as far as uh, sheriff sales, that's, uh, I talk about that in the land and deed presentation. Uh, if you see in the land and deed that there was a sheriff sale, it should reference a court case. And you have to go into the criminal court or the civil court case to find it. So the case of Acres Mill here in Cobb County, which my mom doesn't descend from those brothers, but related to the family, they were sued out of business by the railroad. And then it was a, a sheriff sale auction of all the land. And you see somebody running in going, wait a minute, I own half that lot. You can't sell my farm. <laughs> yes, ma'am, we're tied. All right, was there any? Anything else online real quick? If not, that, I'm done. Yeah. You can also ask questions during the, the question panel at 11. Yeah, we will have a, yep. uh, a, a Q and a panel for a bunch of experienced genealogists, including Mr. Thomas. So we could um, save those questions for the panel session. Did you want to say anything, Kayla? Just tell them we're on break. We're on break, thank you. We will reassemble in 10 minutes. Be, okay. be back 10, 15. <laughs> you better. You got to be up there. Thank you. It's a good sound. There's a lot of stuff I don't have to explain. I didn't even go on a lot of people like you ship it
Okay. All right. And then we'll chat about that. Okay. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we are ready to start our second session. Uh, I want to thank you all for joining us this morning and thank Larry for his uh, presentation. And Laura's pounding on the table here. Um, I, I think that our presentations complement each other very well, and I'm, I'm very pleased for that. It wasn't exactly planned, but it does work out well. Uh, my name is Kayla Barrett. I'm deputy director at the Georgia Archives. I have been here a little over, actually it'll be 26 years in a couple of weeks. Uh, and my I'm, familiarity, I won't call it expertise, is with, with Georgia records and particularly before 1900 because our genealogy records and the microfilm collection focuses before 1900. And this morning I want to talk about using Georgia court records in genealogy and to talk a little bit about the that will be necessary to talk a little bit about the history of each of, each of these courts and there will be some legal terms here that will be used uh, but the slide deck is going to be available on our Georgia Archives website under the programs page. So you can refer back to uh, the slide deck for any terms used and also for the resources that I'll be mentioning at the uh, end of the presentation. The historic courts in Georgia at the state and county level up to about 1900 uh, include begin with the Superior Court, which was established in 1777 with the first Constitution of Georgia. The Inferior Court, and we'll talk a little bit later about the functions of each of these courts and, and how they can be used for genealogical research. The Inferior Court from 1789 was created by the Judiciary Act of 1789. Uh, the Court of Ordinary in 1851, uh, which continued the name change to the current day probate court in, eight, in 1974. The Georgia Supreme Court in 1846, and Larry mentioned a New York State Supreme Court case uh, that had genealogical information in it, so you can find those in Supreme Court records. Uh, the county court, uh, which uh, was established right after the Civil War and then abolished with the Constitution of 1868, but then it was reestablished in 1872. And each of these either handled cases or dealt specifically with matters, matters dealing with estates. The Superior Court, their functions uh, included hearing felony criminal cases, equity cases, Disputes between parties, you will find civil lawsuits. M many of these are often lawsuits over debt. Uh, divorces, the Supreme Court heard and the Su Superior Court, I'm sorry, heard and judged evidence for divorces uh, with a jury trial. And there had to be in the 19th century two jury trials in two different sessions of the court. And until 1833, then that evidence and the verdicts were used in the General Assembly to grant, uh, pass a law uh, finalizing the divorce. Until 1833, when the Supreme Court, uh, the Superior Court, General Assembly, I'm sorry, decided they wanted to get out of the business of handling divorces. It was taking up a lot of time. And the Superior Court became the, the final uh, court of decree for divorces, which it is to this day. Uh, cases involving land, real property, those were held, uh, heard exclusively in the Superior Court because the Superior Court also recorded deeds and also appeals from lower courts until 1846, uh, establishing the Georgia Supreme Court. So they also had a judicial review function. The state it was and is divided into judicial districts for the Superior Court with the district judges hearing cases in each county within that district and the wrote a circuit from county to county and in some states that's referred to as the circuit court. Here it's the Superior Court. Uh, the law mandated at least two sessions per year depending on the size of the county and the caseload that could be either three or four could could increase more. 
to that, the Superior Court heard estate matters concerning lawsuits by the administrator to recover debts owed to the estate. Larry mentioned about court cases where the estate is being challenged, but also uh, estates were also drawn out by lawsuits uh, where the estate is trying to recover money that's owed to the estate. And also lawsuits among heirs involving property, usually land. If it involves land, that's going to be uh, adjudicated in the Superior Court. Now, minutes may include very little information, especially the early minutes. Uh, it may only get, give you the cases that were heard in the court, the verdicts and the judge's orders. And those practices vary from county to county, sometimes wildly. Uh, so if you find a record book, a minute book with minimal information, there's also, uh, you might find a writ book or a final record book. Now the writs do not uh, are not we don't have them for every county and not every county kept them. But when you can find them, for, especially for those early cases, those are a real gold mine because they include all of the documents that were submitted to the court about the case. The documents that you would find in the case file if one survived. Petitions, motions, pleas, demurs, affidavits, bonds, interrogatories, subpoenas, verdicts, all of those are recorded in these writ books. In 1881, the General Assembly required both the Superior and the Inferior Court to keep a final record, which is the formerly called the writ book. And sometimes they're also cataloged as, as proceedings. But again, uh, they are not kept uh, by all counties prior to 1881. What are Superior Court records? What records can you find for these early Superior Courts? The minutes, which Larry talked about. Uh, and again, what exactly is recorded in the minutes can vary from county to county, but you might find, we'll find the list of, in case, of cases, indictments for criminal cases, bonds for criminal defendants, the civil and criminal jury verdicts, and the sentence uh, should be in the minutes. The case files, Larry talked about the case files, and those are include documents that were submitted to the court, which we, you would also find in, in the writ if we, there are writ books available. Now, the case file is only what survived. So for early uh, years during the county's existence, you, you may not have a complete case file, but there may be a file with the documents that have survived in, in a folder. Where can you find these case files? Uh, in our database on our website, Georgia Archives Finding Aids, Those is, that's the catalog to our paper or original records, and you can search by the name of the county to just see what's available. Uh, Family Search uh, is also a good source where the records have been micro, those case files have been microfilmed and then scanned and made available on Family Search. And I'm going to be focusing on records that are available here at the archives or at on Family Search as opposed to making trips to the, the courthouse because Larry's covered that pretty thoroughly. And, and again, the case files are not available for every county. Yes. Uh, we have a question from the chat. In the early 1800s, did each county superior court keep its own minute books? Each county kept its own minute books for the superior court. So it's it's not for the judicial district. It's for the county superior court. OK. Where can you find writs? Uh, Look in our microfilm card catalog, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later, and also in Family Search where those writ volumes have been uh, microfilmed and then were scanned under court records. Here is an example of uh, very early Superior Court minutes from Camden County in 1900, and I'm showing this to, to as an example of what the minutes look like and how to identify what the minutes are referring to. Uh, you have here the, at the top of the left, the jury that has been, uh, the jury members that have been uh, sworn in and then are available, that's the jury pool for all the trials heard, heard during that session. And then below that, you start with cases, and there's a wide variety here. Jacob Kunis, administrator of Robert Harris versus Ralph Thompson and James Akins. You know that that is a case concerning an estate because it's the administrator who is suing. Uh, 
Then we have a state versus John Gorman. This is a criminal trial and it's for hog stealing. And uh, the, the notation here about the case, in a criminal trial, the jury heard the evidence and then decided whether to issue an, an indictment and, and proceed with the trial, a true bill, or if they don't find the evidence conceding, uh, I mean, convincing, then they would no bill that indictment. And in this case, uh, they heard the case and no bill. So that case was dismissed. The, the evidence for the hog stealing was not convincing. Uh, then right after that, you have a uh, Nancy Blunt versus Redden Blunt, a bill for divorce. And so here's an indication that the, the wife uh, submitted a petition for a divorce. We don't have the details. We don't know what she was alleging was uh, the legal grounds for the divorce. All we have here is that this case was dismissed. And when you're looking for divorces, you do need to follow the minutes very carefully because of the two trials. And then the petition will be submitted at the very beginning and just follow it through there to find out what happened because often these divorces do not go through. Uh, the jury may uh, not find for the, for the plaintiff. Uh, they just, may, she just may not follow up on it or he. Uh, so, you have to follow the minutes very carefully just to see how that case proceeds uh, within the Superior Court. Then William Johnston, Johnston versus uh, Thomas Norris is a trespass case. And in this case, the defendant died and the case was dismissed. So we know what the conclusion of that case is. And then Francis Sterling here had been called for jury duty, but he has an excuse. His wife is ill and he's asking to be excused from, from jury duty. And so he is excused from that. And then the last case here is Richard Gascon versus John uh, Hampton. And we don't know what the charge was, what the issue was. The case is simply referred. So you'd have to follow in the minutes if this is the case you're tracing to see any other notice of that. But you can see here that this is a huge variety of cases, uh, everything from criminal to lawsuits to estate manners. And uh, these cases within the, the session of the Superior Court that can go on and on and on. And the impression is that it's pretty chaotic. The Judiciary Act of 1799, uh, 10 years after the first Judiciary Act, did uh, clarify some matters that were handled by the, the Superior Court. And I've pulled out a few that would affect estate and, and genealogy research. Uh, again, they reiterated that the Superior Court has jurisdiction over any case involving land. Also, no suit or action can be issued against any executor administrator until 12 months after the will is probated or after the letters of administration are granted on an intestate estate. So if you find a case, then it's probably the deceased and you just, this is somebody that you're interested in, you're probably going to need to back that up about 12 months of to see when the case, the administrator was appointed and that gets you closer to a date of death. Uh, and there's a practical reason for this because executors and administrators must publish notices in newspapers for the creditors or debtors to, to submit their claims for the estate. So the 12 months is to allow for that process to play out. Communication is very slow. You have to publish in several issues of the newspaper uh, that in order for any of these creditors, give them time to see that and submit their claims. And uh, the Administrators have to do that to this day. They have to publish a notice in the newspapers uh, that, that if there are any debts or, or um, any claims against the estate, you need to contact the administrator. Uh, the Superior Court can also compel distribution of intestate estates and payment of legacies. So that's uh, taken away from the inferior court, which we'll go into a little bit later. And so the heirs can sue in superior court to go ahead and distribute the, the uh, pay the legacies and distribute the intestate uh, uh, proceeds. If a woman was standing to sue in court, she's a femme sole. She has to be declared by the court that, in other words, she has no guardian. She has no husband. She conducts her own business. 
Uh, most women under the law have no standing to sue in court, but those who do have been declared a fem sole. If she's a plaintiff in a case and she marries while the suit is pending, then the suit proceeds in the name of the new husband and his wife. And that's an important genealogical clue that could also trip you up uh, trying to figure out what's going on. And again, an example would be when a woman is acting as her late husband's administrator sues and then she remarries before the case is concluded. Here is an example, a very early example of what we think might be going on here. And this is again from Camden County Superior Court minutes in 1900, where Stephen W. Moore and his wife are, they are the administrators for Richard Cole and they're suing someone named Clark and they haven't even bothered to put in uh, the full name of the defendant because this case was dismissed. Uh, but the clue here is in the case. Well, why is Stephen Moore's wife included in this administration for Richard Cole? The question there, well, does that mean that his widow had remarried? Uh, so where do you find any kind of, then, then you need to follow that up. So I looked in the Camden County will book for that time period to see if there was anything about an estate for uh, Richard Cole. Uh, he's in the index. This book happens to have an index. And in looking at those entries, Mrs. Ann Cole, widow of Charleston, uh, petitioned to be named administratrix for Richard Cole, deceased, died in test states. So there you have some few, a few facts about that case. But notice also that she's a widow of Charleston. There, the inventory for that estate is in the Camden County will book, as it just happens. And the, and, uh, he owned land in, in Camden County, and that's all that's included in that inventory is the Camden County land because they are actually in Charleston. And with a little bit of ancestry search, there was a Richard Cole in, in uh, Charleston. He's in records as late as 1790. Uh, so, but if you are to match that up with this Ann Cole and try to figure out if she remarried, then you would have to go to South Carolina records to do the research. And unfortunately, South Carolina did not record marriages until 1915. So there are other records that you'll need to look for to confirm that. And it might even be within the probate uh, that would be in South Carolina. The inferior court was created in 1789 and the inferior court had several different duties. And to find those records there, those would be recorded in the minutes, but it will indicate whether the court is sitting for these various duties, which are called the purposes. You have minutes for the court purposes because uh, the they, inferior court had concurrent jurisdiction with the superior court to try any cases, civil or criminal, except where the superior court had exclusive jurisdiction. So they could try civil cases, criminal cases, and also crimes of enslaved persons were the exclusive jurisdiction of the inferior court. So that's in the inferior court minutes are where you are going to find any of those trials. The inferior court had an or a county purpose because uh, the inferior court dealt with the county's business until 1868. So those minutes would include contracts for bridges, ferries, roads, county buildings, bonds of county officials, the payments of county funds for work. Uh, these are often used to research the history of a county because you would you would find information about building the courthouse, for example or specific bridges or ferries that you might find in other historical records. Uh, they also oversaw the poor and they also handled the poor school funds. That's part of their function of overseeing the poor. Uh, the poor school records can be a good source of genealogy where they have survived for the counties. If the uh, General Assembly appro appropriated money for poor schools, then it would be up to the inferior court to handle that money and to track any payments from that money. Uh, ordinary purposes, probate. That is now a function of the inferior court until 1851. So those minutes are going to include admitting wills for probate, letters of administration, uh, might note a division of property and letters of dismission, but it's only going to be the order. Now, sometimes the record will be included in there, but at least you can find the date for these various actions in the minutes. 
Uh, guardianships and apprenticeships were handled by the, or the inferior court for ordinary purposes. Caveats, those are the protests for wills, and those are recorded in the minutes, and those are they, they can be a lot of fun. Uh, and also lunacy hearings were overheard by the inferior court. Also, the inferior court issued uh, and recorded marriage licenses from 1805. That's when the General Assembly first required the state or the county to record marriages. Here is a transcript and this of uh, inferior court minutes from Lincoln County in 1797. And this appears was typed up for the Works Progress Administration's Georgia Historical Records Survey Handbook that came out in, in 1940. And you'll see that it's very easy to read because it's a typescript. And uh, they went to great effort to mimic the appearance of the written record in this. But again, it's much easier to read. And here you can see uh, some of the, the business that this inferior court is um, taking care of. Early minutes for the inferior court, especially as they are just feeling their way about how to do this, will include may include all those different types of cases uh, or, or uh, purposes of the inferior court. And then later on, especially as the inferior court uh, has uh, larger caseloads, they'll start splitting those minutes into a book for county, a book for or probate or ordinary, and a book for court. In this particular case, we have the jury that is sworn in, the jury pool, and then we have various lawsuits. Uh, most of these, we don't know what the issue is and the cases are continued. Uh, then we have where Elizabeth Wright uh, petitions for a guardian, so she's over 14, and uh, that she wants a guardian named and who she chooses. Then the rest of that page, the transcripts on the next page, uh, the following morning, uh, we have the justices who are sitting for the court. And then uh, that Matthew Talbot of Wilkes County draw $20 for the, from the collector of this county for his services in running a line between this county and the county of Wilkes and also for his trouble in drawing a map. Now, Lincoln County was created in 1796 from Wilkes County. So here uh, they're ordering that uh, the county line be drawn, surveyed, and also a map drawn of the county. So in these minutes, you have a little bit of each type of the inferior court's business. You have cases, you have a guardianship, which is, which is ordinary, and then also the county business where the map is, is being uh, paid for than that had been commissioned. Uh, and here is what the original looks like. Uh, it's available in Family Search, and of course the transcript's much easier to read, but you can see, actually this handwriting is, is pretty good and it's pretty clear and it's easy to read, but if you're not familiar with cursive writing, that can be a challenge. And if you're not familiar with uh, 18th and 19th penmanship, that can be a challenge as well. And then sometimes there's just bad handwriting. Probate records. Uh, one thing I would say is, in addition to what Larry is saying, is that you need to be a detective in searching for probate records because they may be found in the strangest places. But start with the assumption that if there's property, the deceased had property, that something has to be recorded somewhere. You just need to keep looking. Uh, Counties have different recording practices in how they keep their records. It's not uniform by any means. Uh, all types of probate records might be recorded in one volume, and that's common early on. And also for small counties that just don't have that much business, the books are expensive, and it's expensive to keep different kinds of books. So often that may depend on how much business is before the inferior court. Uh, but you never know until you look at the records. There may be several types of probate records in one volume, uh, and that practice varies from county to county. Uh, inventories and appraisements and sales, that's a popular combination, and also annual returns and vouchers, that's a, another popular combination, and then sometimes you have all four of those types of records in uh, one volume. So if you see a heading in Family Search or in our catalog, uh, for inventories and appraisements and you can't find sales, check the book. 
go to the book either on microfilm or if you can find it in family search and just look to see what types of records are recorded in that volume. And as, as Larry indicated, divisions of the states might be recorded in the annual returns or possibly uh, in the inventories and appraisements and sales, and those can be hard to find. Very few counties have a separate volume for the divisions of estates. Uh, so that, that and, and genealogists want those because that's a good clue to the heirs, especially in intestate cases. Uh, and also records can be recorded in the minutes instead of in a separate volume. You can find wills recorded in the minutes or the dismissions uh, from the estate. All the businesses has been finished and the caveats again are in the wills or in the minute books. The Court of the Ordinary was created in 1851 and the uh, probate and marriage functions were moved from the inferior court to the separate Court of Ordinary. So after 1851, uh, it's the, the Court of Ordinary that is handling all of the probate and the marriages. But the cataloging in Family Search and in the Georgia Archives often confuses ordinary or inferior courts. That dividing line of 1851 isn't hard and fast within the county records. So you need to look in both places. You might have to. And so check the listings for both of those types of minutes. Um, I think that in some cases it was easier just to catalog everything as ordinary because ordinary is probate. And in other cases, counties continued after the ordinary court was created, calling it the, the inferior court. It took them a while to catch up. Uh, but and again, the name of this court changed to probate to court in 18, 1974. And then we have miscellaneous record books. You never know what you're going to find in those, uh, where those records are recorded. And it's just there's such a mishmash and hodgepodge that it's just called miscellaneous records. This is from Union County, the probate records from 1851 to 1876. And these are two adjoining pages. And on the left, you have the inventory and appraisement of the estate of Morgan OMB. And then on the next page, you have the annual return from a completely different estate, uh, J.K. Duncan. So with miscellaneous page uh, books, you they can be a gold mine, but you really have to look for the records to find them. The Floyd County Court of Ordinary Minutes in January of, of 1895, this trying to unravel what is going on with this citation is a challenge. The citation itself has A.H. Ellis applying for guardianship of Radford Ellis, William V. Ellis, Elizabeth Ellis, Ellis, and Jackie Ellis. And it states that they are the minor children of Jack L. Ellis of Henderson County, Texas deceased, and Sally Ellis, and the children own property in Floyd County, Georgia. So what on earth is going on here? The children are in Texas, but there's someone in Georgia applying for the guardianship. Uh, and this is an example that follows up on something that Larry was talking about. A little bit of sleuthing and ancestry shows that John Lyle or Jack L. Ellis died July 20th, 1881 in Texas. Uh, he's buried in Texas. His father, Radford Ellis, died May 31st, 1894 in Georgia. So, and you notice that this is about seven months before this guardianship is applied for. So that's what's going on here. Um, the children uh, have inherited or the, they're getting a portion of the land from their grandfather's estate and that's in Georgia. Also, the 1880 census does not list Jackie Ellis. So you have the name of another child in this petition here. And that's important because there's no 1890 census. And by 1900, the children are scattered all over the. So you're not finding that relationship that you would find in the census because Jackie was born after 1880. Also, you can find in Ancestry that who is A.H. Ellis? He, Alexander Hamilton Ellis, is the brother of Jack L. Ellis. That's why he's applying for the guardianship in Georgia to handle the land that his nieces and nephew, his niece and nephews have inherited, though they live in Texas. And it's just that one little portion of the estate. The Georgia Supreme Court. Uh, 
It was established in 1845, and the first cases were heard in 1846, uh, and, and the opinions issued in 1846. Until 1846, the, the Superior Court had the power to correct errors and grant new trials. They had judicial review of, of Superior Court cases, and, and the parties in Inferior Court cases could take exception to any proceedings, and then they had to go through a few more hoops before it went to the Superior Court. They had to have it reviewed by the Inferior Court judge, and if they did not want to grant relief or a new trial, then they could ask a Superior Court judge to re, uh, review it. And then they could order the Inferior Court judge to send up the case for review. Now, the, the words that are in italics are important because uh, of what can be submitted for appeal to the Supreme Court or for judicial review. You can't just say, well, I didn't like that verdict, so I'm going to appeal it. You have to demonstrate that there were errors in the trial and how it was conducted according to law in order to have it reviewed uh, by the Supreme Court. So that's very critical. So then they will, um, let's see the next one. Well, it, you need to submit a bill of exceptions listing all of the errors, and Larry made, named a few of them, but if you are looking, especially at any kind of case, and sometimes in the uh, state cases, the errors that are listed are just kind of all over the place. Um, but a good example of an error in a trial would be if the judge issued directions to the jury that were contrary to law and that made the jury come to a decision that was incorrect according to law, or if evidence had not been submitted properly or withheld properly, and not that would have affected the outcome of the trial. Those are a couple of obvious errors that you might find. Uh, where do you find Supreme Court records? for Georgia Supreme Court in the published opinions, the Georgia reports and those you can are available in many law libraries because they're published. That will include a summary of the case from the lower court and a, and a, and a summary of the legal questions that were raised with this appeal. And then it includes the decision of the Supreme Court based just on those legal questions. Now, sometimes in, a, in the opinion, you might find dissenting opinions where there is controversy among the judges and they feel strongly enough about it because the vote is not unanimous that the, the those who voted uh, opposite of the majority will feel compelled upon to write their own opinion, uh, arguing. When you find that, it's a good indication that the questions raised are uh, controversial and and that those issues are, are a hot button. So that that can uh, raise a lot of legal questions and it's very interesting as well. The Georgia Archives has the Supreme Court case files uh, well into the 20th century and those case files will include the Bill of Exceptions listing all of the errors and all of the documents that were submitted to the Supreme Court for review of the trial. Uh, and it will also, at least in the 19th century and into the 20th century, includes the case file from the lower court. So that's another place where you can find a case file from the lower court with all of uh, the documents that were submitted for the case. This I want to talk a bit about a Supreme Court case, uh, Hargraves versus Law. There was an 1881 decision in Ware County. And uh, I'm choosing this for a couple of reasons because of the issues that were raised. This case has genealogical information that I have not found anywhere else. And, I, and I've looked to kind of fill in some of the gaps here. Uh, and also the Ware County Courthouse burned in 1874 and all the records were destroyed. And this case involves an estate. So there are no estate records to fall back on to find out what really happened. All you're going to find is in the Supreme Court case file. Essentially, so here, this the introduction to the case in the Georgia reports has the legal issues, uh, this and what uh, some of the issues, wills, estates, titles, and judgments. Uh, that it was heard in Ware Superior Court in 1881 and who the presiding judge was. And here's a summary of the case according to the Supreme Court. John Hargraves, born in 19, 18, 1797, he died uh, on October 1st in 18, in 19, actually that's 17, 
1857. His last will was signed on June 10th, 1856, a year before he died. And he devised to J.M. Hargraves, who is uh, the plaintiff here, his entire estate. And in the event that he could not inherit, which is not exactly what the will says, uh, he devised the estate to John Denton and William Denton. Uh, the devisee, and Larry used that term, uh, the heir J.M. Hargraves, when that will was made in the death of the test testator, he was a slave. The will was admitted to probate in 1857. 21 years later, J.M. Hargraves finds his bill against Lot et al. Uh, and he says that he came of age, he turned 21 in 76, and that he was entitled to the estate, that the defendants had colluded with the executor and had wrongfully, these defendants had wrongfully obtained possession of a large part of the estate. The executor is deceased. He died in Sullivan in, in 1876, and there's no administration of this estate. So here is an example of an estate that is drawn out. Many of the participants in the original uh, se uh, settling of the estate are deceased. And the, the petition from the defendant, I mean the plaintiff here, John M. Hargraves, your orator, uh, here is the genealogical nugget in his petition. Uh, John Hargraves, uh, he made his will in June of 1856 and he signed and published his last will and testament. Uh, on and, and actually the, the petition, that is blank uh, when he signed the will and then he died leaving that said will. Actually, the death date is, is not clear here. But so he's saying that John Hargraves was his grandfather. Now, L.A.W.H. Pittman was named executor and the will was recorded uh, in court in November 1st of, of 1857. The defendants re made, uh, responded that, well, uh, just briefly, well, he was a slave at the time and the statute of limitations is run out and then they were told they need to present more evidence and answer more fully. Uh, so here is the genealogical nugget in their response and you will notice that this is horrid handwriting here. It looks like a backhand possibly of a left-handed person. Not sure about that, but the witnesses were allowed to testify as follows. Follow this. One Charlotte was the slave of John Hargraves. Charlotte was the mother of Caroline. Caroline was the daughter of John Hargraves and Charlotte. And that Caroline married one McGill, a white man. And the, that complainant, John M. Hargraves, was the issue of Caroline's marriage to McGill. That's the genealogical nugget here that, that is in this particular record. There are a couple of probate records that were submitted as part of this case file, uh, his will and uh, the inventory of the estate. In his will here, he says that he bequeaths and devised to my beloved grandson, John Marcellius Hargraves, who I am now raising, all of my estate, real and personal, uh, that he's possessed of now and that he would have at the time he dies. And he re-emphasizes that. There's another item where he leaves him all of his land, all of his enslaved persons, all of his cattle, and there were a lot of cattle and it was worth quite a lot of money, just as an aside here. Then in the seventh item, if the grandson dies without issue or heirs, then he substitutes John Denton and William Denton. And they happen to be the grandsons of John Hargraves' half-brother. All of these people are related in, in one way or another. Just to reemphasize here, Georgia law in 1857 that this case turns on, the status of enslaved persons is through the mother, not through the father. Charlotte was the slave of John Hargraves. Their daughter Caroline was an enslaved person because her mother was enslaved. Caroline's son John M. M. Hargraves was an enslaved person in 1857 because his mother's legal status was as an enslaved person under Georgia law. Also, enslaved persons cannot inherit. That, it's very explicit in the law at the time. 
And just as an aside, there's no mention of a manumission of, of either Charlotte or Caroline or John M. anywhere in this case file. So that's not the issue here. Here is the decision of the Supreme Court in the September term of 1881. Uh, it goes back and forth a little bit before the opinion's written, uh, and also it went to file, uh, trial in Wayne County jury for the, and the jury found for the defendants. Uh, the opinion is very brief, three paragraphs. The controlling question made in this case, whether a slave can take a device or bequest under a will made and taking effect by the death of the testator during the existence of slavery in the state of Georgia. That's the, that's the question. Any other questions, uh, the judge is saying, any other question that was raised, this is the one that controls the decision of the case. And it's not open uh, with us, with the court. There are precedents and under the principle clearly ruled, in those cases, the bequest is void because that was the law in 1857. And the, the other question is the judgment of the court of ordinary in even submit, uh, accepting that will, it doesn't affect the question of the right of the complainant to the property devised because, especially because the testator directs in his will where it should go in the event that the complainant cannot take it under the laws of the state. So there are secondary heirs, they got the estate. As far as the judges were concerned, it was clear cut. But this case does have that genealogical information about uh, John Hargrave's parents and his grandparents that you're not, John M. Hargrave's that you're not going to find elsewhere. I've, I've filled out uh, just checking to follow this up and I don't I don't find anything. County court. The county court was created in 1866, and then it was abolished by the state constitution uh, that was adopted in 1868. And the county court, even though you're not going to find that stated in the enabling act for the court, it was created in part to handle matters concerning the newly freed former slaves. Uh, they had they replaced the inferior court functions except for those dealing with county business. So they could handle civil cases under $100 and criminal cases except those punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary and other misdemeanor cases. Uh, and just as an aside, that sentence, if uh, will be carried out in the jail time served in the county or the county farm. They don't go to the state penitentiary. So if you're looking for those records in the state penitentiary, you need to be looking at the county. Uh, apprenticeship records, they also deal with that. And those can also be found in the ordinary minutes at the same time period. Uh, again, the court was abolished, and the, but then it was reestablished in 1872, but 45 counties were explicitly exempt from the county court and the law. Now, these records are often cataloged, can be cataloged under the inferior, the county court, but they almost may, also may be under the inferior court or an ordinary court minutes. What you're looking for is that date of 1866. Uh, also, it can be called criminal court. And in some of the smaller counties, they're not even kept in a separate book. They just, within the inferior court minutes, they suddenly start calling it county court. So that's something to be aware of as well. Here's an example of county court minutes from September of 1866, and you see that they are handling, and these, these are really easy to read. Uh, they are dealing with criminal cases, and it states the race of, of the defendant here. There is the charge, and he pled guilty here. There are several other cases on the preceding page with the same thing. So he's fined $200 in cart court costs, and because it's unlikely that he can pay such a large fine, alternately work five months in the city of Savannah Public Works. And there are other cases that that sense is going to depend on the, uh, the severity of the crime. If for a fray uh, or creating a disturbance, the, what I found is much less than this in the, the number of days, maybe 60 or 90. We also have here a number of civil cases. Uh, these are mostly related to debt and the judgment is all through the, the, for the plaintiff. So what's going on here is that there is a backlog of cases from the Civil War 
where cases were not heard that need to be cleared. A new court is created and this is a great opportunity to transfer those cases to the county court and get them cleared off the docket. And I think you find that frequently when a new court is created, it's because they're the business for the upper court, there's too much to handle. And that makes it a little bit difficult to decide, at least in those early years, whether you need to look in, in which court you need to look for that case. There's a lot of crossover there, a lot of gray area. Apprenticeships, uh, a few counties, including Terrell, kept care, uh, separate apprenticeship books. This one from 1866 goes on to 1920. Uh, the genealogical information in this uh, apprenticeship, uh, the ordinary is acting as guardian and he has a contract with James S. Lee, 1882. The genealogical information, he binds and apprentices James Lee, a certain colored girl named Matt, about seven years old, and an illegitimate child, Ascilla Jones, a colored woman who cannot raise and care for her daughter. So here you have some basic information to look elsewhere. You want they will be they should be look in the 1880 census and and see if you find them there. Matt would have been born about 1875, but also this that she's illegitimate. It's unlikely that you're going to find the name of the father, at least in the census records. The the terms of apprenticeships are fairly standard. The uh, the person had getting the apprentice has to provide them with food, clothing, medical attention, schooling, in this case, enough to learn to read. She needs to go to school enough to learn to read. They're taught a trade. In this case, she's learning housekeeping, cooking and washing, uh, and that he is to treat her with kindness and humanity and discipline no more for to get for obedience than he would correct a father with his own child. So the wording may different, differ from apprenticeship to apprenticeship, but this is fairly standard. And, and sometimes there's also a paragraph of what the apprentice owes, obedience, uh, loyalty, uh, and good and, and uh, hard work, good work. Yes, ma'am. Uh, do these apprenticeships and also just in general, the Georgia, the way the Georgia judicial system mm -hmm. is set up, is that followed in most other states? That I can't tell you. Now, Georgia uses apprenticeships because there's no foster care. The county has to take care of the orphans and the way for them to do that so they're not a burden on the county is to apprentice the, the, the orphans. Uh, you find this with white orphans before 1865, but after the Civil War, there are abandoned children and mothers who cannot take care of their children. So you're seeing more black children being apprenticed after 1865. Yes. Um, before you go on, I just saw something. Um, in this case, going back to the Hargroves, I was ready to go to the end, but this case, the Hargroves. Yes, the Hargrove the case. The colored woman or the black woman was married to the white man. This is similar to the 1818 case. And we found in Liberty County, we were looking for was there a provision? And we thought during this period, what does uh -huh. it mean that because it's in the court records, were they really married by some legal entity? Her marriage is actually recorded in Emanuel County. So if it's recorded, okay, so this is like the 1818 one? A little bit, yes. And so the question that and the question that was raised there is when exactly does the law forbid uh black people and white people to marry. Exactly. So, and and we're trying to pin that down because of the Liberty County case that, that Emma mentioned. Um, and we really haven't found anything before 1865. Or, yeah. Uh -huh. In Georgia, there was a provision, but when Georgia became the state of the Constitution, mm -hmm. we can't find anything until 1866. And actually, I haven't found that 1750. I, I, I'm, I'm not able to find it yet. If you have it, I would love to know. And then then there would be an enabling act when the royal governor takes over to to. Um, when in the South Carolina mm -hmm. research right. to me. Right. Yeah. And I've heard from her. Yes, okay, yeah. so this this is this is similar, I, I think, because of this that. 
she's passing for white and her father is trying to pass her for white and also his grandson because there's no mention anywhere in his records of their race. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're looking at the Freedmen's Bureau records really uh -huh. in the black community. Uh -huh. and we're seeing incidents where black men are saying they're married to white women, and we're thinking that could not be. Right. So, so there's a lot more work that needs to be done on this topic. And, it, and, and it's very interesting to see, it's interesting to see how people uh, deal with the law, for, for lack of any other word. And there, there is a, a there are stories there, definitely. There, there's a narrative there. You know, we discussed that. Uh -huh. Good plan to be the richest. Uh -huh. so if you have enough money, you can do anything you want. <laughs> and if you don't have enough money, you're more likely to be caught out at it. Right. But from what I've seen, um, like we've been looking at Lexington County, and so like you could see a lot of the planters, and you see the slaves, like if a planter is slightly displaced, then the wife would file for divorce. And oftentimes it wasn't granted, but then when you look at the church records, the planter might be excommunicated from the church. And so therefore you see like this array uh -huh. of what it was like when it was born. Mm -hmm. Also in Augusta, Georgia, there's a church transcript they have where in this church they are marrying these it's like women to these white men. This is a church record. So we assume that because the church does it doesn't mean it's legal, right? Right. Right. Uh, also, I don't find, I haven't found in this case file for John Hargraves any mention of his being married. Yeah. Ever. That doesn't mean it didn't happen, but I haven't found any evidence of it. Okay. Oh, well, and also if that was in Ware County, the marriage records burned. But there, there's certainly not any of that in the testimony. Uh, resources for finding uh, court records online or at the Georgia Archives. Uh, the County Records Microfilm Index is in the virtual vault. That's our card catalog to our microfilm collection for the county records. Uh, and it has a listing of those and includes the court records. Uh, and those are, that's from our microfilm collection. And then also Family uh, Search uh, has a lot of these the same microfilm, it's been scanned and it's made available online. So I check remotely first in, ANS, in Family Search, and if you can't find it there, check to see if we have it. And then the next thing would be the probate records within the county or, or the court records within the county. Uh, finding aids at Georgia Archives, that's our database for our paper records. And you can search for the case files and other records there. Just search for the county name. You can do a keyword search and see what we have. And those you will need to come to the Georgia Archives to review. Uh, the creation of a judicial system, the history of Georgia courts uh, by Irwin Surrency. It's a publication which we have in our holdings. It's a very clear uh, it's, there's a lot of detail there, but it's a very clear history of the courts, how they were created, when they were created, what their functions were, why were they created, sometimes speculation. But if you are confused about, as I was, about uh, what certain courts were supposed to handle, this is a good place to, to get that information. And also the database Georgia Legislative Documents, which has transcripts of Georgia laws passed between 1799 and 1998. If you want to look up those specific laws uh, regarding courts, you can do that by keyword searching and, and also narrow it by year. Uh, also, there are many definitions of legal resources for legal definitions available that are online. So if you run across a term and you're not sure what it, what it means, Google it. Uh, if you have access to a law, uh, Black's Law Dictionary, that's great, but uh, there are also just, there are sources available online for this. Uh, also, we have a database here at the Georgia Archives, Hine Online, and it has records, some of these records for all 50 states. Uh, I have here, and don't worry about this, it's on the slide deck. There's terminology that Hine Online uses. Well, what does that mean? The Session Laws Library, those are the publications by the, the legislature of every state for the laws passed in that year. So it, it just deals with what was in that year. 
uh, state attorney general reports and opinions, state constitutions illustrated for every state. And if you look at that, you will find that Georgia is not the only state that has had multiple constitutions. Uh, state reports, uh, these are the Supreme Court reports for each state, uh, the published opinions. So if you run across a case in another state and you kind of want to know what happened with that, this is a good resource for that. And also the state statutes, which might be the most valuable portion of this uh, for all of the states, the digest, the compilations and the codes that have been published by the states going back uh, a full archive of those. If you want to know what the law was in Alabama about marriage at a certain time, you can go to the digest or compilation uh, just after that time period to see what the law was at that time. Finally, if you have any questions about finding court records, uh, please feel free to ask us. Use our Ask an Archivist email reference uh, form here, which is on our welcome page. And just let us know what you're looking for and the dates and also the location. And that will give us time if you submit it by email to, to consult our sources and come up with an answer for you or for a referral. That's it. Any questions? Uh, I'll go with you first. Um, as county boundaries uh -huh. changed, was there a process where cases were moved? And no, not well, they might move to the new county, but the, the cases that already uh, have been settled, those were those are at least cataloged as the records of that county. But like a pending case? That's actually a good question. I know in Clark County, we've got a couple of Jackson County estate records that was started when Clark was part of Jackson from the 1700s, and they got transferred to Clark Courthouse because they didn't get settled till after Clark County was created. But that's why it's weird because you'll see a date on this case that predates the county's formation. You see what I'm saying? So that's a clue that it got moved from the other county. I know, I don't know much, but that much I know. <laughs> OK, we're we're running over here, so if we can start, go ahead and start the panel session. And, and certainly if you have questions about either Larry's or my presentation, you can raise those uh, with the panel. And we'll be happy to help you. I suppose you get a copy of what you just presented. This, the slide deck is going to be on our website on the programs page. Okay. This particular slide deck, just the slides. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Recorded, right? And the program is recorded, and that would be available on our YouTube channel. Okay. So, we're to seven questions. Oh, good. But I think people might use that to add more, but I can't access the account on my phone. Mm -hmm. So, you may want to bring yeah. it up on here. Good in order to get to the account to see where the questions are, mm -hmm. you have to log in. So I can't log in. Then we we'll just need to read it. Right, but if there are more questions coming in, as a panel okay. is discussing, okay. won't be able to get that. So don't submit your no, questions to the form. Website. Submit them through chat. Yeah. Okay. You should tell them that. Okay. Okay. We're go we're going to ha we have a, a handheld microphone that we're going to take around to, so that you can ask your questions so all the panelists and the online audience can hear. Okay. Okay. Yeah, just it once next week. Last time you did, I put you to work. Do you still have that? Because I'm going to pull up the website. I'm going to pull up the website. Oh, I'm Larry. Nice to meet you. Are you still are you still are you still yeah. uh, sharing the screen? Yes. Okay, you just, good. You have to stop. Oh, okay. right. Yeah, yeah I'm going to. Screen. Okay. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
We have a couple. Do you have any more? Yeah. Barbara. 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 Yeah. 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 So what we're going to do is we're just going to share this one when we respond so that people in the back can hear us. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Did you want to introduce the program stage? Oh, yeah. Is that better? No, can, so can you hear me through this paper? Uh, There's another echo. Can you have an online attendees here? Okay. Let's make a can you speak to that to see if people can hear? Testing, testing. Can you guys hear us? I want to show you awesome. what I have on screen here is, is our programs page uh, on our website where the slide deck is going to be. Uh, here, here. Okay. Okay. All right. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Okay, good. Uh, I'll repeat what we have up on screen here is our website, uh, georgiaarchives.org. If you go to visit and then click on programs, that's where the slide decks for our programs are located, and that's where my slide deck will be. And also, the program, the recording will be on our YouTube channel. And could the panelists just briefly state your name and uh, any of your affiliations that you want to let people know about? Sorry, Laura. My name's Laura Carter. I'm a retired reference librarian from the Athens Clark County Library. And for many years, I was in charge of the Heritage Room at that facility. And I'll give a plug, go there and research. They have a lot of good stuff. <laughs> Hi, my name is Tammy Ozier, and I'm a retired finance executive. I'll put it that way. Um, I'm the current um, president of OGS, the Afro-American Historical and Genealogical Society, Metro Atlanta um, chapter. Hi, I'm Tamika Strong. I'm a reference archivist here at the Georgia Archives. Uh, my name is Barbara Stock. Uh, I'm a uh, okay. Bar my name is Barbara Stock. Uh, I'm a certified genealogist and uh, uh, have been a professional genealogist for about 30 years. About 20 of it professionally. Well, I've done research for about 30 years. 20 of it professionally. Uh, at this time, I primarily do forensic genealogy for attorneys, and I'm on the board for the Council for the Advancement of Forensic Genealogy. Okay. And my name is Larry Thomas. I'm a professional genealogist. I've been doing research for over 30 years and professionally for uh, 15. Okay, it looks like you have to talk to work with him. Lose a little bit uh, if losing your voice. We're going to start with the questions that were submitted through forms with registration. Uh, the first question, when are we going to be able to publicly access the Georgia Legislature Act 1857 and prior? Okay, I will answer that. <laughs> the Georgia Legislative Documents website has um, has the transcriptions of those laws prior to 1857 and then going back to uh, 1799. Now, the, the acts prior to that, including um, colonial acts, those are in, uh, there are a couple of sources for that. One of the more widely used is Watkins Digest that was published in 1799. And that is available online through, through uh, Internet Archive. So, so those records are available online. Uh, and if you're not clear about how to find uh, Watkins Digest, if you would email us, we'll be glad to send you a link. Okay. Next question. How do you advise those researchers of African-American genealogy who hit the wall of slavery? I have traced my maternal great-great-grandparents, Pauli and Charles Lyles, to Pine Knot, Georgia in the late 19th century. I am having trouble, however, dealing, detailing their lives before 1870. I'll take a stab at that. Um, I think one of the things to make sure when we say we've gone to 1870, have you gone all the way? Is, can you hear me? I think now. Um, have you gone all the way? So that means have you traced all of, have you done all of the 1870, 1880, all the way um, from a census perspective? And not just looking at the population census, also look at the non-census um, records to see if by chance your people um, owned land or if they rented land, you're able to see um, who they rented from. But whenever you, you're talking about genealogy, just in general, you want to make sure that you're filling out all of the information. And it's not just going like from your parents, grandparents, great grandparents. Who were their siblings? Who were their children? You want to look because you're not just looking at vital records for your direct ancestors, but you want to make sure that you're capturing all of the information for the collateral um, um, ancestors. So, um, uh, you want to make sure you're looking at birth records. You're looking at, you know, the general stuff, birth records, death records. What um, are you looking at in the newspaper? 
Um, if you're talking about prior to 1870, what are the type of records that are available? Um, of course, the Freedmen's Bureau records, you're looking at um, property um, census, if the, the, there were censuses in your particular state. I think in Georgia, there wasn't one, there was one in, um, I think, 1860, so that may not be um, appropriate. But in general, you want to look at state censuses. Um, the other thing I would say, you have to know the community where the family was. Who were their neighbors? Um, making sure you understand those names. Who were the people that are listed on your 1870, for example, that may have been enslaved? Because now you're gonna you're gonna try to find that group of that community within the slate within documentations. So documentation, what type of documentation am I talking about? I'm talking about um, estates. I'm talking about inventories. I'm talking about, you know, did, um, were in your community, were there um, estates that were settled? Who were, who did the enslaved persons go to? Um, what is that genealogy? So it's a whole different, it's a whole, you're not finished. Just by getting to the 1870, you're not finished. So that's just some of the things I would, I would just comment. I'd like to share something. Um, okay. I, in my research, genealogy research for slave ancestry, you also need to look at if there was uh, white children, their father, when, when these white children were married, a lot of times they were, their, their parents gave them slaves. So you've got to follow that person too. And you also have to look at the name change because if a woman was Smith and she married Jones, then the children became, or the slaves could be Jones or Smith, whatever. Can I hear? With, with, the, with the microphones, you really have to hold it, both of these right up to your mouth. If Can you, you hear move me it just now? a little bit, you're going to lose it. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So you have to look and look. You, yes, you do look at the community. You look at what um, what slaves were giving to. It sounds like a ball. Let me see. It sounds like a ball. Sorry. <laughs> testing. Uh, testing. Testing. The bathroom is actually not dead. <laughs> the, <laughs> no, 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 it's working. Okay, we, it sounds it sounds like we have a short in it. I'm yeah. sorry. So, um, yeah, now, yeah, <laughs> sorry. Now, I have a big mouth. <laughs> <laughs> you have to look at the, the, in addition to the community, you look at what slaves were gifted to the children, where they went, did they change their names, and um, there was one other thing I wanted to mention, but it escapes me now. Um, that's basically it. I, I can't remember the other uh, point. I would like to add also if they paid poll taxes or if they were free, they usually had a white Caucasian counterpart that had to like vouch for them. So a lot of times you can find it that way. Yeah, I was going to add, as a gentleman stated earlier, church records. Those things have to say short. Church records, uh, a lot of the uh, churches were uh, they're predominantly white, allowed the slaves to uh, attend church. They're listed in the church minutes of being baptized, married, and sometimes died. And also tax records. After uh, the Civil War, what are the tax records? And a lot of the freedmen, the taxes were paid by their white people. I remember oh, what I, for those. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I remember what I wanted to say. Some slave owners had several plantations and they were not necessarily in one state or one county. And they switched their slaves back and forth to those counties um, and, and, and also those uh, states. So that's another uh, clue or helpful tip. It sounds like we need another program about basics of doing African American genealogy, which we can talk about doing that with, with AUGS in February. There are still a lot of questions that people have. Okay, next question. My ancestors migrated into Dooley and then Baker County in the 1820s and 1830s. Are there any resources at the state archives that can help overcome the Baker County courthouse fire and floods? 
few records before 1879 and subsequent courthouse fires of child counties, Mitchell, Doherty, Worth in the 1850s and 1860s. And we have another question uh, that was submitted is, where can you find records from Burn counties? Laura. Well, I'm not sure that this will answer all, but in Georgia, we're lucky. We have a resource, a book that was published by Paul K. Graham that lists the courthouse disasters and tells you what records were actually destroyed. Because a lot of times a county is listed as a burned county, particularly in some of the older resources. And so people just don't ever bother to look to see what's still there. And that's not necessarily accurate. A few years ago, some of you who are around here may remember seeing the pictures of that god awful uh, Hancock County courthouse fire, and it looked like everything was destroyed because you could see the flames through the back of the building. Well, actually, it was mainly the probate records that were damaged, and the Georgia Archives has been working with Hancock County doing some conservation and preservation on things that were remaining, but the deeds are still there. So don't take it at face value when it says there was a flood or a fire or whatever, that everything is gone. Do some further investigation to find out what really does or does not exist. That to me is your first step. The other thing is, particularly for deeds, a lot of times people would bring in their copies of deeds and have them re-recorded later. The problem with that is the deeds recording dates don't match when the family got the property. So that is a problem you have to be aware of in a burned county. Just, uh, just to add to that, Hancock County, all of the Superior Court records were destroyed. They, there were some uh, probate records that were saved, but the, but Hancock had actually they've done a good job of, of microfilming their 19th century records and 18th century records. So we have microfilm of those and all the deed records were backed up. So they, they were in good shape with the deed records. Uh, but it's, it's the 20th century rec records for Hancock that where there's a lot of loss. Okay. Emma. I heard, we can't hear what, but I heard somebody mention Baker County. Yes. This is one thing in general to remember. These counties were carved out of other counties. <laughs> Baker, I know in particular, was carved out of early counties. So when a new county is a, it, it come into existence, they don't move the records. So they could be, I would look in the counties that they, they were carved the out of. And to follow up with what Laura said. Could you repeat what she said? So that okay. Uh, she asked about Baker. Baker was carved out of earlier counties. Check the counties that they were it was carved out of. There may be records for that area that are in surrounding counties um, for an earlier date that did not burn. And also, I want to uh, reiterate what Laura said about check the card catalog, check our card catalog, because it may say there is a fire and it may say all of the probate records are destroyed. If you actually look at the dates, not all of them were destroyed. So always check your card catalog because there may be some that survived. However, there are some there just is nothing there. Ware County is one of those and Twigs is another. Brand, the, the Book of Brands survived. Oh, oh okay, the Brands book. <laughs> oh, and, another, and another issue about this with lost records is, is not only did sometimes the uh, ordinary take them home to work on them and they therefore they survived, but, but another reason for loss is that the county officials may have loaned records to someone to write a county history and they or something like that and they just never come back yes ma'am that's a good resource um, um to to find out when the counties were established even is uh william dollarhide's book um i forgot that mapping the uh, census mapping the census mapping the census mm -hmm. yeah yeah it just gives you with not the disposition of the um records of uh, but, but it gives you the past also in cases of Burn County's uh, newspaper records, yeah. and Georgia has a lot of the old newspapers, many of them online, um, and 
Also, uh, often the records would spill um, spill over into neighboring counties. Uh, it, sometimes it was more convenient to go to another county, um, you know, uh, to record your records. So uh, I would look at the adjoining counties. Those those legal notices had to be published in the newspaper. There aren't that many newspapers about 1870, so you had to publish in a regional newspaper. And some of those regional newspapers are available online and you can buy legal notices there. Um, Just the papers. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Milledgeville, Macon, Augusta, Columbus, uh, Richmond. Oh, that, yeah, that's Augusta. Uh, Savannah as well. So, okay, next. I'm gonna those those were the legal notices. But, um, one other thing that I take a look at is the tax records for property taxes. Because mm -hmm. in Georgia, you have a list of the property you have in other counties as well. That's true. Okay. Uh, someone asked if we can email the slide presentation, and I've, I've stated it's going to be on our website and, and uh, under the programs tab under visit. Uh, next question. I'm interested in voting, researching voting records for my female ancestors in Georgia especially in the years immediately following the passage of the 19th Amendment. What is the best strategy for locating these records? That's a tough Cobb County, we just discovered the uh, main library had the 1920 voter list, and Cobb County Genealogical Society has digitized them and in the process of indexing their names that we could read. So, it's just going to be county by county to see what uh, the librarian knows about and what exists. And, th and that's going to be a county record. We don't have voter registration records for the entire state from that time period. Can we check with the Secretary of State's office? They do not have them. I found Brockdale County in a basement. Uh, a basement. Right, so again, it would be county by county. Yeah. You have to go county by county. Did the counties have voter list back in the 1800s? Very, very, uh, very few. There's At least in Georgia, yes. In Chicago, they had them because I've used them. <laughs> One thing you want to do is you want to check our um, virtual vault for our county cards because we have cards for nearly all the counties that were established prior to 1900. And so we have the county cards that are downstairs in the microfilm. We actually digitize those and they are online. One of the caveats also with that is like Kayla said, Family Search also has digitized, has those microfilm. And so Family Search has digitized all of their microfilm. So one of your first, first tasks you should do if one, you don't have a Family Search account and you're doing genealogy, that's, they tell me I shouldn't do homework, but you have homework. If you don't have a Family Search account, that's what you need to do. You need to register, it's free and it's comparable to Ancestry. Secondly, learn how to use Family Search because a lot of the records that we have here on Microfilm are also available via Family Search online. So you can be sitting at home three o'clock in the morning with your beverage of choice, and you can look at those Microfilm records. <laughs> now, some of these records are browsable, meaning that you can't search them by keyword. So you just be prepared to spend some time with these records. But the best way to learn about the records is to go play with the records, and the records are there. However, not all the records are on Family Search. We do have records on Microfilm that have not been digitized. So when you are here, and this is your other assignment, I'm sorry, Amanda. <laughs> if you don't have a researcher's card with us, make sure to get one. And I'm probably going to put myself on the hook for this too, because we have Microfilm records that are not available online. So while you're here, take a look at what we have for your particular counties so that you can see what's available. And, and, and added when, when she she said that the records are not indexed in family search, it's the same access as you would have to the microfilm. Right, basically. it's browsable. They're they are working on indexing that, but it's going to take a long time because there's a lot, stuff. a lot of stuff. A lot of this is if I could just jump in. Mm -hmm. That answers one of the questions that we had from uh, the online folks um, finding out about county court records um, if they're still held by the original county or transferred to the Georgia Archive. Um, if you don't find those on Family Search um, and you're not able to travel, the first thing to do would be to check with us at the Georgia Archives and then check with the county. Even if you're not able to travel, you may be able to reach out to someone at the county courthouse 
or check with the local genealogical society. Somebody might be able to provide local knowledge. Right. Yeah, I was just going to add one other thing. I know we haven't mentioned Ancestry, but Ancestry is a paid account. So if you have access through your libraries and also here at um, at the archives, you can um, you could have you could also have access to that. So a lot of things that are on Family Search also have similar information on Ancestry. So just one more thing about that to follow up with Tammy said um, in Georgia. All the public libraries have free access to Ancestry. So if you don't have a public library card, that's your other assignment. Go to the library, get your library card so you can access Ancestry on site. On site. If you have your laptop and they have Wi Fi, you can access it using your device online. Mm -mm. No, Galileo is a statewide initiative. So, so it's through Galileo. You may, you may have to get to a different way for Galileo. But all the public libraries in the state of Georgia has I access to Galileo. Uh -oh. that, that doesn't say my love. What you think? That doesn't sound right. Because that's a huge piece of what the libraries offer. So yeah, I definitely would check that. The other thing uh, with Family Search, some of their records are not viewable from home. You have to be at Family History Library or an affiliate library. And if you go into their search wiki, put the state and the county, scroll all the way down to the bottom for uh, uh, resources. Click on affiliated libraries, but right. Cobb County is. All Cobb County libraries have access. Bartow County has it. Cherokee County has it. And I can't list all the others. Let's, let's, did you have? I really didn't have a question. I wanted to okay. give two cents. So, Family History Library, I've actually been in person. And to your point, a lot of the things that, uh, like, for instance, you can't access. Uh, Carroll County records are locked. Right, yeah. But if you go on site to a Latter day Saints church and access their VPN or Wi Fi, you can have access to those records. A lot of the times, the Ancestry gets their records from the Family History Library. So the stuff that Ancestry charges extra for, the birth certificates and stuff like that, if you access it through the VPN at uh, Latter day Saints place, it'll give it to you for free. So, or have a good friend who's healthy ass. Yes. They'll pull the records for you, but a lot of places that exist in present day, I mean, well, in the past, that don't exist present, um, mm -hmm. it exist, doesn't exist now. And they have books there that you can call and ask, and they'll tell you where that is presently, and they'll give you the coordinates. Okay. So you can put that in Google. Okay. I think you were first. Um, um, I was a volunteer in their history library, uh, the LDS, and um, some LDS, and, and you are correct about the access to certain other um, mm -hmm. um, sites, but also some of your LDS have books, literally paper books that you can look through at, as a library and not just like the Yes, ma'am. Well, it, okay. this, this is actually family search and it has to do with their, their agreements with the uh, government that supplies records. So they have to have permission from the county government or whatever agency to make those records available online. Um, some counties, frankly, are not aware of what's in microfilm. So it has to do with their user agreements. But, but so they don't go online. Correct. You go in person. Like right. If you can access okay. those things. Yeah. Right. And that's, there's also uh, uh, what was perceived as a difference between access through the family history centers and to LDS members because that is their work product. To scan those records, put those online, and to do any indexing. Okay. Let's move on. Uh, I need hints on finding birth records for Macon, Georgia around 1895. No clues at all to mothers or fathers' names. Birth certificate search came up empty. I will say Georgia did not require registrations of births before 1919. Okay. There are some exceptions in certain counties. Anyone want to speak to that county? 
Was it make it? Is it making one of the ones on our website? I think make it had earlier. Because um, there's what Atlanta, Augusta, Columbus, Savannah. Savannah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so to follow up with um, and not and I'm sorry, Kayla said <laughs> there are some locations that have birth records prior to 1919, and so it looks like the city of Macon, Bibb County, did start collecting in 1891. You'll have to contact the health department to get access to those records. And so on our website, under our research tab and research help, we have online research guides, and one of which, the very first one, is Vital Records. So if you're curious about what locations had registrations for births and deaths prior to 1919, that's a good starting point. Because if you go some other places, they're going to say 1919, but we know that there are other locations that um, started prior to that. So Lewis, Lewis had a question. You may have to go to Bill, uh, to the courthouse, and they have, if you can fill it through all the books there, I mean, they have everything that's been digitized and, and printed and put in books. Um, most of the folks there bump that up on, on uh, research and genealogy, so you may have to go back there and find it for yourself. So it's possible that you may have to go to the courthouse, but then another great resource in Macon is the Washington Memorial Library, the Genealogy Center. That's definitely a place that you should go if you're researching in Middle Georgia, because that is also the location for the Middle Georgia archives. So just go down there and they have a very, very good research um, collection there. I think did we have. What did you say? Washington, what? Washington, Washington Memorial. Yes. They have the yes. Genealogical Historical Center. Yeah. 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 Yes. yeah, I just want to uh, make sure that everybody's aware and uh, I've written about this before, but. Um, your vital records are in, in vital need of you going in there to your legislator and speaking up and because they're getting ready to basically make those records not available to you. Um, yeah, so, 100 years. Wait, yes, but 100 years or something about it. So uh, get down to your you know, the state way. house. Speaking. I said is to look at family search because um, Channel County has birth, have birth and death before for the 1900s, and I know like it, um, you're looking at Burnett County, it looks like some of the people in Burnett County scooted down to um, Savannah to have their, um, their America, at least their best recorded. So you'll see them there. But, and they're all family search. I think that family search, they just go to that state and county and, and see what they have. But they have some of the early chefs and birth records before the 1900s, before 1990. Okay. The other thing, and this was mentioned earlier, check church records for birth and death records. Church records, particularly in rural Georgia, <laughs> are really one of your best resources. Because in rural areas, that's where people went on a regular basis. So what the gentleman said earlier about how he was able to do his research using those, and this does not just apply to Georgia. Rural areas just work different than other places. So you've got to change your mindset when you're dealing with rural people. Okay, next question. Is there an inventory of courthouse records available by county? Those that are not microfilmed uh, or not easily found or readily available. And I'm thinking particularly of uh, the the WPA uh, did inventories yeah, for about 10 counties um, in Georgia. during the 1920s. So that's one resource. Yes, ma'am. Well, we, we have oh, I'm, I'm from Tennessee. And I'm trying to find Overthought County, Lexington. Oh, uh, yeah. Represent over. Was it recorded before 1919? Do you know? Oh, birth and death records? I'm not yeah. sure. I don't think there are birth and death records for all before prior to 1919. When she called, they gave her this address. Yeah. Right, because they're going to send you to us. <laughs> but see, that's the thing. That's the thing. When they when you call Vital Records and you ask them for a birth prior to 1919, they're going to send you to us. And so depending upon the time frame, we're going to either tell you that, like Laura said, look at church records, newspaper records, 
or we're going to tell you to look on our website to see what counties and locations did collect it prior to 1919, or we're going to tell you to call them back and say do a delayed birth certificate because if the person lived long enough to get a social security card, they possibly have a delayed birth certificate. And so if they have a delayed one, you when you call by the records, do not say the year because if you say the year, they're going to send you back to us and we're going to send you back to vital records. So if they call, if you if you ask them to do a delayed birth certificate search, that's what you do. Don't say the year you because if you, you say specify, anything before 1919, yeah. they're going to send you back to you us. You need to specify that it's a delayed birth certificate and that delayed birth certificate was necessary to file for Social Security. So whenever they file for Social Security, because those are filed by the date the certificate is issued, not the day of birth. Did you have something uh, to add? Speaking of Oglethorpe County, the library in Ogl in Lexington has a the library in Lexington has a really good collection. And check the microfilm here, because they've got a lot of the microfilm here that the Lexington Library bought and has in their collection. But historic Oglethorpe is a very active. Well, it used to be a very active historical society that did both genealogy and, and um, history. So check, but while you're here, check the reference library for the Oglethorpe County Cemetery books as well. To answer the question that was asked, I'm not aware of an inventory county by county no. of records that the counties have. Those records remain the property of the county the Superior Court Clerk for the Court for Superior Records and the Probate Judge for the Probate Records. So what they say, the access that they allow, uh, they're within the legal rights to do so. Go ahead. This is an archive. Do you all have the authority question? No. I know in Fulton <laughs> County, during the, during the 100th anniversary of the 1906 riot, mm -hmm. uh, we did some research. There are death certificates at Fulton. Oh, they start from the late 1800s. Uh -huh. They're there, depending on the clerk you talk to, you may, let you may know about it, you may not, but we know that because we found them. So my question is, do the Georgia Archives have the authority to go down and tell Fulton County? We do not. Records? We do <laughs> not. There is, there's no records, please. I, I will say one thing I've discovered is Georgia has made a change and you can go into any county vital records and order a death certificate from any other county. That's correct. Uh, I recommend not using Bibb County because they charge thirty-five dollars. If somebody else is charging twenty-five, <laughs> but the question about what do we know, what we don't know, the answer is no. But if you contact the local genealogical or historical society or look for a genealogist in the area, they may be willing to go in there. And if you say I need to look for a particular type of record, contact the court ask if you say you want will book C page five. It's actually page seven, you get it page five. Right. <laughs> Unless you tell them specifically what you're looking for. Okay, next question. I am trying to find my grandfather, and I know that he was born around 1886 in Alabama. His parents died when he was young, and so he was found in the 1900 census living with his uncle and grandmother. How can I find out who his parents were since the 1890 census was destroyed and closest records to his birth isn't available? Probate court? And I will just add here, it is a big problem with people born between 1880 and 1900. If you're missing that 1990 census. If they're born in the early 80s, they are probably living outside the household of the 1900 census. So go ahead. The two clues are in that census record, the name of the other individuals. So you have to research them because if that's his grandmother and his uncle, then you have two members of the family. So you just have to figure out. Right. Who is who. So that's the if first one. If you find the grandmother in a previous census and maybe when her children are still living in the house. Right. You can kind of create a list of names right. that you can kind of select from. And one of the things people don't realize is the 1890 population schedule is what was lost. The board telling schedules there and a lot of the schedules are still there. So go look at those too. If that does not work, then I think probably probate records in Alabama would be your next bet. And, and that would be probably in the county of where the parents died. 
Who about service records? The tax records. If this is Alabama, I'm not sure about Alabama tax records. I'm not an authority on that. But you could have, if they had a farm, they had the animals and everything. Right. You also could look at the tax records. But then if you're also researching Alabama, if you're researching Alabama, you definitely want to check with the Alabama State Archives to see what they have. Because when you're doing this research, whatever search location you have, you definitely want to look at the state archives as one of your first stops because it could be a one stop shop. But then you go to the public library. You also look at the geological and historical societies. And you can also look at the academic libraries in that research area as well because they may have private papers. They still have the service records over there at the National Archive. Mm -hmm. yeah. And one other thing I would say about Alabama, Alabama is one of the states that also had state censuses. That's I don't true. know um, what the um, time frame would be, but I know they had a eight, they had a sixty six, eighteen sixty six. Yeah, they they were yeah. So right, so the so you should check also the state censuses. Good. Um, I find it really really. Uh, not really expensive. But I joined all the little genealogy societies where my folks were. Yep. In Crawford County and Bibb County and places like that. That's about Bartow County, you know, and, and it's, that's about maybe 10, 15 dollars a pop and it comes once a year. Uh, so I print all those, I get all their little publications, and I also, you know, send uh, questions to them and get it back. It's not, not a far ride from here to Bibb and here to Bartow. So. But I always join those, those uh, associations. So yeah, Lewis is suggesting that you join the the genealogical societies and historical societies in the counties where your families were. That will give you access to their publications, their programs, and also their members who will have more knowledge of those local records. And I do know some professional genealogists that will join every association <laughs> uh, to, to get access to that information. Yes, sir. No, County records We've got a good collection of Richmond County records. Um, and then you got um, the Augusta Geological yes, Society too. Right. Because I'm having the problem We got some representative in the audience from that Geological Society, so. <laughs> Alabama made a big old apology because they started their archives to conserve the records of the Confederacy. Confederacy right. so they have started a project and their plan is to digitize all the records that pertain to anything about African Americans and slavery. They started with records that will probably you all will probably have grandchildren here and you'll be gone to see where I'm going to see Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> but that is what they're doing and they're posting them. So keep in touch with Alabama. Okay, and, and in enough. answer to your question about what specifically are you looking for in Richmond County? Uh, I was told the uh, Appling Courthouse had the records at one time. And that would be, what's that? That's, that's Columbia, Columbia, that's Columbia right. which is next door to Richmond. But what right. I, but I, I was told when I was younger that uh -huh. they had the records and then it burned. So. Didn't have a record, so. No, no, I didn't. no. Columbia didn't burn. Columbia has. We we have and we have records for Columbia that they're a little bit confusing to follow, especially those early ones. But if you're looking for around 1920, and are you looking for one thing? We have property tax digests here at the archives. The counties were required to submit a copy of their tax digest to the state beginning in 72. So from 74 on, we have a fairly complete, up to about 2002, uh, collection of tax digests from every county. I have a uncle that disappeared basically off the map. Okay. <laughs> and also in Richmond County, the Augusta Genealogical Society has some of those delayed birth records. Huh. And, and if, yeah, okay. yeah if there was one before, they had the book that they just did, or they got to skip because that happens a lot too. 1940. Yeah, so odds are iffy that there's a birth certificate because you're right on that cusp. Right. Check with you guys the genealogical society. They are they are temporarily holding some of those delayed birth records. 
that were generated for when people went, like she said, to go to five sessions to hear his And they do have some Florida Virginia County records in their custody. Yeah. Right. So they, they are a good, they're an excellent resource. Yeah. Yeah, they're also, I'd like to add that just because a county burn, like Taylor County to be known mm -hmm. to burn, there are books in this reference library that gives you really great information. Mm -hmm. My own personal, my dad's great great grandfather, there's an obituary book for that county. And he was actually a slave. And that book details that he died uh, on the plantation of Joel E. Montford, and he was a native African. So the books go to the book. We, uh, do we have any questions from chat? That we need to address? Uh, yeah, we're working on a couple of them. Uh, 